أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين عباد الله أوصيكم إياه بتقوى الله وطاعته وأحذركم وإياه عن عصيانه تعالى ومخالفة أمره يقول الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم من عمل صالحا فر نفسه ومن أساء فعليها فما ربك بظلم للعبيد We begin, my dear brothers and sisters, as we always do, by emptying our hearts and our minds from all of the thoughts and emotions that occupy us. Thoughts and minds of our worldly lives, our challenges, our difficulties, the issues which grip us emotionally. And we surrender, and we surrender to a state of presence before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We imagine ourselves detached and disconnected from the life that we live and enter into a quiet space where we feel Allah's presence and this, in this enhanced sensitivity to feeling Allah's presence, we then bear witness that there is no God but Allah alone, the Almighty, the All-Merciful, the All-Compassionate, the All-Powerful, the Just, light of the heavens and the earth, creator of the heavens and the earth. And we complete this testimony by bearing witness that our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, is his beloved servant and messenger whom Allah sent to be an exemplar to mankind, to be a source of mercy to humankind, to be an instrument and a teacher of Allah's mercy. May we ask Allah to bestow his salawat and his salam upon his noble prophet, upon his family, his companions, his successors, and upon all the Muslim community that has followed in his footsteps. I urge you, my dear brothers and sisters, as I urge myself to be mindful of Allah and of his commandments. I caution you as I caution myself against disobedience to Allah and of violating his commandments. For Allah has said in his own book, whoever does good does it for his own sake. Whoever commits a sin, who does a wrong, has also wronged only himself. And your Lord is not unjust to his servants. My dear brothers and sisters, my late father, whom many of you knew, was a director of Islamic Center in New York and then later in Washington. He retired in 1992. And a couple of years, or within a couple of years after that, I was talking to him one day in Washington, D.C., in his home. And I, mentioned, and I mentioned to him how great a resource he still was to us and to the Muslim community. And I made some suggestions as to how he might spend his time. He answered me, very peaceful look on his face. He says, Faisal, I've worked for 50 years and I've had enough. All I want to do now is to prepare myself for my meeting with my Lord. I felt my jaw drop and I've a sudden feeling in my heart, just my heart just sort of like went warm like that. And, I, and the feeling in my heart said, of course, what could be more important? I've often thought of that moment. And one of the things that I, that I have always been struck by was by my emotion. Why did I feel that, that sense of emotion? Because I knew for all of my life that we, we never know when we will die. I've always known that we have to always be prepared to return to our Lord. And since it can happen at any time in our lives, what surprised me was, why was I so surprised? Why did I emotionally respond that way to hear my father say that? Why did his in statement impact me so deeply? My father's comment made me think about the phases that we live in our lives. As young children, we grow, we go to school, we graduate from school, 
and then maybe we go on to college and then we focus on establishing our career. We focus on earning enough resources, financial resources to be able to get married, hopefully to the love of our lives, to have children and grow up our families, take care of them. We focus on taking care of our children until they grow up to adulthood and build lives of their own. And my father was fortunate at that point in time to have lived long enough to be able to have completed all these phases of his life. When we have fulfilled all these phases of life that often, that often distract us from focusing on Allah, what else is left? No longer distracted by these life phases, my father now felt free to focus entirely on Allah. And I, I loved that freedom that he felt. And I loved that he felt that freedom to focus solely on Allah. And I also admired how he understood his priorities and how he prioritized what was most important to him. Today, my dear brothers and sisters, with advanced medical care, greater numbers of us are able to live longer, long enough to complete the chapters of our lives. What a gift it is to be at the phase, at that phase that my father was, and to look forward to death, not just as the end of a life well lived, but to look forward to death as a return to our beloved creator, to, to look forward to death with a sense of deli deliberativeness, to return with a sense of gratitude to Allah and with an anticipation of being, of returning to Allah with the hope that Allah will be pleased with us. I'm reminded at this point of the Hadith Qudsi where Allah says, whoever looks forward to meeting me, I am even more looking forward to meeting him. And so the question that this raises, brothers and sisters, is how do we best prepare ourselves for meeting our Lord? Mawla Jalaluddin Rumi gives us a clue in one of his apocryphal stories. And many of his stories are really apocryphal. They're not literally true. They are made up stories to, set, to, to convey a lesson. In this story, Rumi talks about a farmer who went to the prophet Moses and beseeched prophet Moses to pray to Allah so that Allah would grant him the ability to understand the speech of animals. Moses was surprised by this request and wasn't at all keen to do so. But the farmer kept imploring him since he had several animals and he argued that by learning their language, he would be better able to take care of them more effectively to be a more effective master, master and caretaker over them. So after much pleading, Moses agreed. Moses prayed to Allah that Allah grant the man his wish and his wish was granted. Sometime later after this, the, fa the, 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 the farmer now understanding the, the, the speech of his animals. One day, the farmer heard the rooster say to the dog, next week, our master's horse will die. On hearing this, the farmer immediately proceeded to sell his horse. When he later heard the news that the horse actually died, he felt fortunate that to have not lost the value of his horse. Sometime later, a month or so, the month overheard the rooster again saying to the dog, next week, our master's ox will die. On hearing this, the man immediately arranged to have his ox sold to the butcher. He was so happy that he gained for a second time a windfall, a benefit from having learned this piece of news in advance. And he felt so grateful to Allah and to Moses for his prayer for this wonderful gift. A month or so later, the farmer had the ghost to say to the dog, next week, our master's slave will die. On hearing this, the farmer rushed to sell his slave. And for the third time, the farmer received a windfall benefit from this very special gift that Allah gave him. 
a farmer now felt on top of the world. He felt especially gifted by Allah. He felt Allah had given him a very special grace and a very special gift. But a month or so later, the farmer had the rooster tell the dog, next week, our master will die. This time, the farmer totally freaked out. And, and in a fit of panic over the prospect of losing his own life, he ran to Moses to seek his advice, his help, and his guidance. On hearing what happened to the farmer, Moses advised him to now what he should do is it the same as what he did to his horse, to his ox and his slave, and find someone to sell himself to so that he would not lose his value. Now, Ro doesn't always tell us the significance of his stories. You have to sort of glean it on your own. What Rumi has done in this story is set us up for verse 111 of Surah Tawbah, Surah number nine, which reads as follows. Inna Allah ashtara min al-mu'minina anfusahum wa amwalahum bi anna lahum al-jannah. Indeed, Allah has purchased from the believers, has purchased from the believers their souls or their cells and fusahum and their wealth in exchange for paradise. They fight in Allah's cause or for the cause of Allah. They, they kill and they get killed. This is a genuine promise, a promise binding upon him, meaning upon Allah, a promise binding upon him in the Torah, in the Evangel, the Gospel, and in the Quran. And who is more true or who is truer in fulfilling a promise than Allah? Allah says, So rejoice, be happy in the sale that you have transacted. This is indeed the greatest accomplishment, the greatest victory. Now let's look at this. You have certainly heard the English expression, oh, so-and-so has sold himself to the devil. Now we use this expression in English and this expression conveys the idea of a person who has basically just dispensed with all moral sense of morality in order to gain whatever he can gain in the dunya. Basically, he has sold himself to shaitan in order to win the dunya or whatever he can grab from the dunya. We don't hear the expression very often that so-and-so has sold his soul to God. So I'd like us to start introducing this idea of selling your souls to Allah. The Quran says that Allah has purchased the believer's souls in exchange for paradise. In other words, you give up, you give Allah yourself and your wealth, Allah will give you uh, in exchange for this, trade or for this sale or for this transaction, he gives you the promise of eternal paradise. So what Allah tells us here, what Allah is describing here, is the exact opposite of the expression selling your soul to the devil. It is selling your soul to Allah, that you exchange the life of this world and what you might value in it in order to gain the greatest victory, the greatest and the highest accomplishment eternally in the hereafter, Allah's pleasure with you and the reward of his Jannah, his paradise. Now selling yourself usually means that you become a slave to somebody. And the greatest person to sell yourself to is Allah, to be Allah's slave, or as you say in Arabic, to be Abdullah. This brothers and sisters is in reality, the, as Allah says, the very highest accomplishment. It's the highest maqam to be completely a abd of Allah. This is why when we say, Ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh, 
وسائل أشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسول ورسول الله. We start with Allah's slave and then we say his messenger. And you know the story of Sayyidina Isa when he was born and he told his mother right after birth to fast and not to speak to the people that day. So she brought him carrying the infant just newly born, Isa in the cradle. And the people say, oh, Maryam, what have you done? She points to him and they say, how can we speak to a, to a newly born baby in the cradle? And because of the power of the Holy Spirit, Sayyidina Isa said, Inni Abdullah. He introduced himself by saying, indeed, I'm Allah's slave. So being a Abdullah to the same degree, in the same quality as Sayyidina Muhammad and Sayyidina Isa are, is actually the very, very, very ultimate, the highest of any maqam spiritually that a human being can reach. Another lesson that we learn from this Quranic verse, brothers and sisters, is the, de is a, is the definition of a mu'min. Allah here defines a mu'min as one who has sold his soul and his wealth to, in Allah, to, to Allah in exchange for Allah's eternal paradise. Now this, brothers and sisters, is another way in which the Quran defines the meaning of terms. So Allah defines a mu'min in this way. So this is another differentiating, differentiation or a way of defining and differentiating between a Muslim and a mu'min. A mu'min is a person who has sold his life and his wealth to Allah in exchange for paradise. This is a very challenging hurdle. And it is particularly challenging for many of our fellow Muslims to embark on. And it is even far more difficult to achieve. The difficulty, brothers and sisters, is essentially in our minds. It's in our ability to exercise our will. Once you give up the fear that you may have in your hearts or your minds, and start on the journey of selling yourself to Allah, the next steps get clearer. The second lesson that we can extract from Rumi's story is an implicit question. Or it's a, the second lesson is a result from an implicit question. So I'll describe it this way. We all know that we're all going to die. Allah even tells us that. Every soul shall taste death. There's not something that we can prevent. Ultimately, we all will die. Now, if we happen to know for sure that we're going to die next week or next month, we would all make the necessary arrangements and preparations for it. But we really don't know for sure. None of us knows whether we will die a day later or a year later or 10 years later. But you know you're going to die. Now for the question that Rumi's story raises is, how is your response different from the farmer in this story? If you knew you were going to be dying next week, <coughs> would you frantically be running around looking for someone to sell yourself to? Would you feel <coughs> you had adequate time to complete the transaction of selling yourself to Allah? Another way to say this is, when are you going to start? When are you going to start selling yourself to Allah in order to start fulfilling or proceeding on, in, in the direction of becoming a mu'min? And of course, a, uh, a parallel question to that is how far will you go in selling yourself to Allah? These questions, brothers and sisters, are only questions that each of us can only answer for himself, not for others. In our normal lives, brothers and sisters, we're always engaged in selling 
parts of ourselves. We sell our time, a portion of it. We sell a portion of our energy, our effort. We sell our expertise. We sell it to our employers in exchange for money or to our clients. We sell part of our time and energy and effort to our spouses, to our children, to our parents. And this, as I kept thinking about it, is why I was so struck by my father's comment. What he essentially conveyed to me was, Faisal, I'm done selling parts of myself to my work. I'm done with selling myself to my work. And what do I have a family is, you know, pretty much done. So all I have left is I want to prepare myself to the maximum for meeting my Lord with maximum intentionality and the maximum intentionality of selling my soul or what remains of my soul and my wealth to Allah. Now we all know, brothers and sisters, that de facto we are all Allah's slaves. All of creation, all of human beings are Allah's slaves by definition. We came from Allah and we're all returning to him. As Allah says in the Quran, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. And Allah owns us completely. There's nothing really. Whatever we have has come, Allah has lent us. Whether we admit it or not, therefore we are all Allah's slaves. So the issue here is not that we dispute the fact that we are all Allah slaves at this basic and universal level. The issue here is how deliberately and to what extent and to what degree of purity have we sold ourselves to Allah as an act of our human free will? And what is the level of purity and degree that we have dedicated ourselves and our wealth and our resources to Allah's service. Dedicating our wealth to Allah is the easier part to understand. Or what is for many difficult, for many people, a difficult thing to do. But dedicating ourselves to Allah is a more complex thing to describe for it involves a process of calibrating ourselves to Allah and to continually be recalibrating ourselves to Allah and ensuring that we, what we do is done purely and solely for Allah's sake. Many of you are familiar with the hadith where Allah resurrects different people on Judgment Day. And one is a warrior whom Allah asks on Judgment Day who, who fought and died. Allah will say, why did you fight? He will say, Ya Allah, I fought in your cause and to advance your cause. I'll respond, no, that you didn't do it for that purpose. You fought so that people would say what a great warrior you were. You got your reward in the dunya and now you go to hell. Next is a Quranic reciter. Allah asks why he recited the Quran. He will answer, oh Allah, I did that so that people would appreciate the verses of your noble book to broadcast the wisdom of the Quran so they'd learn it. Allah will say, no, that was not the reason why you did it. You, the reason why I said the Quran was so that people would say what a great reciter you were. You received your objective in the dunya and now you go to hell. Next would be a scholar. Allah asked him the same question. He answers, I became a scholar to teach people your knowledge and knowledge about you and your faith. Allah will answer, no, that was not the reason you did that. You did that so that people would admire you and say what a great scholar you were and shower you with various awards. You received your objective in the dunya and now you go to hell. And now there will be a rich man who gave a lot in charity. I'll ask him why he did that. He, he would say, oh, Allah did for your sake and to help the poor. I would say, no, you did that so that people would admire your chat, you for your charitable work. You received your dunya, your, your, your objective in the dunya, and so now you go to hell. This hadith, brothers, this is, is rather frightening. And I urge you all to think deeply about it. What this hadith teaches us, brothers and sisters, that what we should we do should be done purely for the sake of Allah. 
and not for earthly rewards, of which people's recognition is one. This is challenging. For whom amongst us? For who amongst us does not feel happy when people admire your work, when people admire chronic recitation, when people admire your scholarship or your charitable work? This is what I mean by the greater difficulty, the greater challenge. For when you do something well and people admire you for it, the mental attitude that you have to maintain in order to ensure that you do not become questioned like the warrior and the Quranic reciter and the scholar and the you know, charitable giver that I mentioned, the Hadith, that, that we do not wind up in the same situation that they wound up in. This requires enormous self-discipline. There's nothing wrong in being happy, but that must not be the reason why you do it. The reason why you do it is because of a lost pleasure alone. Brothers and sisters, we all have observed among our contemporaries, Quranic reciters who love to be admired, or Islamic scholars who crave recognition for their work. People who compete to win the recognition of others to be in the limelight. The important thing to realize, brothers and sisters, is that you really have to maintain an attitude where Allah is your sole audience that you do your religious work for Allah alone, that you pray not because you want people to see what a pious person you are, but that you pray purely to please Allah alone. In other words, La ilaha illallah is not only an act of I accept there's only one God. It is also that your acts of worship are done only for that one's pleasure for Allah's pleasure alone. They do not partner with Allah's pleasure and admiration, the pleasure and admiration of people. This brothers and sisters is also part of the meaning of what Allah describes as the greatest victory, the greatest accomplishment, Fawzun Azim. It is the greatest accomplishment in part because it's also the most difficult thing to perform. So the most difficult thing becomes also automatically a tremendous accomplishment. It takes constant vigilance on our part for shaitan does his very best to make us slip and fall into errors. And his ways are increasingly subtle that we often do not even notice it. Therefore, brothers and sisters, I urge you to do your best in contemplating this verse and how and to what extent you can and will go in selling yourselves to Allah. Do not be overwhelmed that you are not able to sell all of yourself in one go. It may take several steps, but think of it the way you take a car from zero to 100 miles an hour. You start in first gear, now you have automatic transmission, but still, it starts in first gear or second gear. And as you move a little bit, it goes to second. And then, and then as you move more, it goes to third. You move on to, into the fourth gear. And then after 50, 60 miles an hour, you go into maybe a fifth gear so that you know you, 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 you speed up. So gear it, as you say. Start in your first gear. But inshallah, as time goes on, take constant measure of how much of yourself you have sold to Allah, how purely you have sold yourself to Allah, and to the extent that you have, rejoice, as Allah said, rejoice in the transaction that you have made in selling yourself and your resources to Allah, and recognize that in doing so, you have also taken a measure of the extent to which you have become a mu'min, a believer, and in by virtue of selling yourself to Allah, to the extent of how you have deliberately offered yourself and enslaved yourself to Allah to become, so Allah says, Abdullah. There's nothing better than to, than not only to say, but that your actions 
state that you are indeed a servant of Allah. Brothers and sisters, let us pray to Allah that he may answer our supplications. Would Allah Ta'ala yasajibli wa lakum. الحمد لله الحمد لله كثير ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له المتعال على المشاركة والمشاكلة لسائر البشر ونشهد أن شدنا ونبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم عبده ورسوله النبي المعتبر وعلم أن الله تعالى صلى على النبي قديما فقال تعالى ولم يزل قائلا عليما وآمرا حكيما تنبيها لكم وتعليما وتشريفا لقدر نبيه وتعظيما إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد كما صليت على سيدنا إبراهيم وعلى آل سيدنا إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حمد مجيد ورد اللهم على الأربعة الخلفاء السالة الحنفاء المميزين بعده بالرعاية والولاية والاصطفاء ذو القدر العلي والفقر الجلي ساداتنا وموالينا وأئمتنا أبي بكر الصديق وعمر وعثمان وعلي ورد عن السلطان السعيدين السيدان الشهيدين القمرين النورين سيد شباب أهل الجنة في الجنة ورايحان نبي هذه الأمة الإمام أبي محمد الحسن والإمام أبي عبد الله الحسين وعن أمهما فاطمة الزهراء وعن جدتهما خالدة الكبرى وعن عائشة أم المؤمنين وعن نقية أزواج رسول الله أجمعين وعن التابعين وتابع التابعين وتابعهم إحسن إلى يوم الدين <تصفيق> اللهم اغفر للمسلمين والمسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات الأحياء منهم والأموات إنك سميع قريب مجيب الدعوات يا رب العالمين اللهم وأيد الإسلام وأعلي وانصر كلمة الحق والإيمان اللهم اجعل خر زماننا آخرة وخير أعمالنا خواتيمها وخير أيامنا يوم لقائك وارفع مقتك وغضبك عنا اللهم ارفع مقتك وغضبك عنا اللهم ارفع مقتك وغضبك عنا ولا تسلط علينا بذنوبنا من لا يخافك ولا يرحمنا يا رب العالمين اللهم أصلح أحوالنا وبلغنا مما يرضيك آمالنا واختم بالصالحات أعمالنا وبالسعادة آجالنا وتف... وتوفنا وأنت راض عنا يا رب العالمين أسأل الله العظيم رب العرش الكريم أن يغفر لي ولكم والمسلمين أجمعين عباد الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان والإيتاء ذي القربة وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعظكم لعلكم تذكرون فاذكروا الله العظيم يذكركم وأقم الصلاة.